you hear a lot uh, now, particularly for those that work in the thriller genre, that they're going for a, a kind of Hitchcockian uh, vibe. W- when you hear that term Hitchcockian, what kind of qualities does that signify to you? I think that's the wrong approach. Um, they think thrill- Hitchcock is the ultimate thriller suspense director, but he's much more. Um, his themes are actually much more valuable than just his style. Initially, he was considered a, a technician, very technically adept, very deft, and very canny, but very superficial. But then there was nothing beneath the surface. It was it was just escapist entertainment. Um, and then, about oh, say the middle fifties. The French, André Bazin, and especially Truffaut, François Truffaut, came out with this theory about auteurism, the auteur being the the French word for author. And they looked at the work of people, of men and women, but filmmakers like Hitchcock, and found out that he wasn't just this escapist entertainment um, fun guy, but there was a real personal vision to his work. And I think that is the thing that has so intrigued me that it's almost like as criticism grew, um, the the films grew, the, the, the sense that these men were not just making, they were not just plumbers proficiently going to work and, and creating very, very, being facile works, but there was a there was a, a, a depth to their work. And when I go back and see all these Hitchcock films, they are inexhaustible. There is level after level after level. I'll give you an example of, of his last film, which I was fortunate enough to be on the set of, uh, The Family Plot. In The uh, Family Plot, it's Hitchcock is using some references to his past. One of the streets that the car parks on is Bates Avenue. Well, Bates Avenue is a reference to uh, Norman Bates in Psycho. Um, there's also somebody that says, well, you shouldn't turn, uh, light a light in family plot when in a gas station. Well, that is a reference to what happened in the birds. Mm. Um, and there's a, 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 a truck, a, a car that comes down a hill in a in careening and and uh, out of control, and that is a reference to both, I think, uh, North by Northwest, and also um, Frenzy. Now the, mm. the 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 one that really struck me, and I haven't seen anybody make this point, that in the film uh, The Family Plot, one of the thing the one the kidnappers want a fifty three carat diamond that's what they want to 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 for for payment to release the bishop whom they have ki- kidnapped well it is of course the family plot is hitchcock's 53rd film so there's all those references also what one thing more sometimes fate intervenes and makes it makes you say wow um he died in 1980 uh, Alma, his wife, who was one year younger than him, died in 82. They were married for, guess how many years? 53 years. Wow. So there's a, there's a, it's inexhaustible. I'd really, you, you get exhilarated and it's uh, a, a, a constant un, unraveling of the themes. So I would say that, yes, they're talking about the thriller and the suspense but it's much more. It's the themes of Hitchcock. Hitchcock has the themes of alienation and irony and the wrong man accused, the fear of the police, and all of those. I just saw a film called Ar- Arbitrage. Now it's not a great film, but it would not have been made if there weren't if there hadn't been Hitchcock. That you can see so many things that are at least responses to Hitchcock's work, the, the, the director, 
went to uh, NYU and obviously was a film student. And you see that time after time after time, year after year, I see films that that would not have been made if Hitchcock hadn't come first. If, uh, Hitchcock was the harbinger of so many of these films and probably, or maybe perhaps, I think maybe the most important filmmaker of all time. Well, I think I would definitely agree with you because I, I, I don't think you could find many filmmakers that do not consider themselves influenced by by Hitchcock. And, I mean, he's also one of one of maybe less than a handful of directors that are international uh, internationally known to themselves. I mean, I, I can only think of Hitchcock and Spielberg. That, that those two are kind of household names for people that don't even necessarily follow movies. Well, that's a that's a very interesting point because Hitchcock made he was like Hemingway in literature that the the image of the man Papa in literature was in a sense very important to the, to the promotion of his work. That Hitchcock's film, Hitchcock, the figure, oh, we're going to go to to see a Hitchcock film. In the 50s and early 60s, you would read reviews that wouldn't even mention who the director was. Um, Nobody really, very few people really had any sense how much film was a director's medium. During the 50s, they thought it was actors and maybe a writer and maybe there was somebody who put these things together. But there really was very, very little awareness of the recognition, awareness of, of the director. And the other thing is that film in the 50s had not yet been recognized as a, as a potential art form, as an art form. They thought it was escapist. They thought it was it was it, it couldn't be art. It didn't have levels. It was image and uh, immediacy, reaction, responses. But it didn't have something that you went back to. Andrew Saris brought this French theory of of the auteur to American criticism, and in 1960, his review of Hitchcock's Psycho was very, very seminal, very, very crucial, fundamental. He said, you have to go and see this film, not just once, but three times. What are the comparisons that you see with with Hitchcock and Kubrick? One interesting fact is that Hitchcock was born in 1899, the last year of the 19th century, and Kubrick died in 19, uh, 1999, the last year of the 20th century. Um, they both had, uh, one, it almost, it almost, they're almost, the two of them span the century. Um, there is also very much a similarity in vision, although people may not recognize it. Both are very, very pessimistic. Both are critical of the significance of mankind. They don't think that man is significant. Both are fatalists. They believe strongly in irony. And you can see that in in work out. And they also are considered stylists more than visionaries that the 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 a lot of the reaction to them from critics and the viewership in, in general is that these are quote stylists unquote that's only one third of it mm-hmm. uh, they are both beautiful filmmakers they both make extraordinary films with beautiful imagery and compelling indelible images and shots but they also have this sense of irony, prevailing irony. It floods through both of their works. This sense that fate is, that man is dependent on fate. And this sense of alienated man and woman, the alienated person caught, trapped in the human condition, is striving but it's, fate is going to decree what happens to them. 
And in, in fact, I think that Kubrick very much could have made uh, um, Frenzy, the, the, the film in 1972, that was one of uh, Hitchcock's last films. That there was a there's a sense of loss. There's a sense of waste. There's a sense of lack of communication, uh, and that we have our better day has passed and our values have been corrupted. Frenzy opens with a shot of the Thames, and it is now dirty. The Thames is no longer the blue that it once was, and they find a the, the body of somebody with a a necktie and somebody says is that the old that's my old club tie my club tie and he's i think hitchcock is suggesting that the old standards are gone and that uh, there that we are we now live in a kind of a, a wasteland we can see that also in kubrick so i also love the fact that the surface of both of their works uh belies what is beneath it. I, w- I want to get back to one, one point that you just made, and it, as it applies to both Hitchcock and Kubrick, their their films do speak to kind of the insignificance of man in terms of their placement in the, in the, in the a cog in the wheel of, you know, this big machine here. But in, in light of that, where do you find the humanism in their work? Because they don't, they don't hate humanity. They think we're in all of this together, that some better than others. But they also both believe in creativity. And if you are creative in a world you never made or people never made, that is something. I mean, you can look at all the politics. You can look at all the advertising. You can look at all of the propaganda and there's something about the beauty and and force and and wonder of vision and going ahead and trying and be, and creativity. And I think both men are creative. The other thing I, I, I want to add, if people think no, Hitchcock's not that that pessimistic. One of the most pessimistic, maybe the most pessimistic film up to its release in 1958 that ever was made in America in a, in a popular film is Hitchcock's Vertigo. I mean, it it, it ends in abject loss mm. when his second chance plummets, plummets and it's the nun that this girl, uh, Judy, who is who is now become Madeline, she falls off the, the, the tower for a quote second time and this time to her death. This time it is the real woman that he loved. And he, Jimmy Stewart stands with his hands forward. And when I taught it, when I taught it in class, the student said, we thought he was going to jump. Now, wait a minute. That, that, he's not going to jump. He's going to live with the horror and loss and, and frustration and pessimism of of, of futility, yeah. and it, it, what what Hitchcock does so well, and a lot of his films have the the life of humor in them. I was talking to you about Frenzy, which I think is really an underrated Hitchcockian film. Um, there is an inspector and his wife, and they are a riot. She is cooking. She is taking up gourmet cooking, and she's cooking dinners for him, and they're awful. I mean, they're, they're, they're just wretched. And the incongruity and the absurdity, and Hitchcock's funny bone is just tingling. It's just vibrant. Um, and that shows part of his creativity. Just because, I mean, all of us know someday we're not going to be around anymore. Well, that doesn't mean we don't strive for the next day. Some people turn to religion. A few turn to art. And I think that both of these men um, have been able to face the world around them and 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 say, 
I believe my my God is creativity. Now Hitchcock was also a Catholic. He was also a Jesuit trained, and it seems like he was he went to mass up till his death. And in fact, uh, a uh, Catholic church had a had a mass for him after his death in, in California. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the, I think I think it's the humanity. It's the I think Jonathan Swift also said, "I don't I don't like mankind, but I like three individuals." I think these are the same kind of men that that they find in the spirit of the creative, the spirit of the realist, the spirit of the man who thinks and perceives and tries to understand. They see a value that transcends, in a sense, all of the failure and all of the rubbish and all of the carnage that are that is around them. Yeah. I agree with you, and I do think that just the act of the creative process is in and of itself kind of a, a sign of, of a hopeful sign and, and w- wanting to discover some new layer in, in humankind. To well, as a, as, a, as, a, as a human being, as a critic, they give me, they educate me to see things that I wouldn't perceive otherwise – and to have a faith and an appreciation and get some exhilaration out of their creativity out of their 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 headlong plunge into the future yeah Uh, i've i've learned so much from from artists more than anybody else Mm -hmm. there's no question that writers especially writers whether it be Scott Fitzgerald, who was my favorite growing up, or James A. G., who was a great fiction writer as well as a great film critic, and filmmakers Peck and Paw, Altman, Scorsese, Ford, Orson Welles, they're irreplaceable. They are they are the jewels in the in the in the uh, uh, toilet of life. <laughs> Do you think? I mean, this is this is a complaint that I've heard, but I, I have a hard time making sense of this complaint. I don't know if there's anything in here to really substantiate it. But uh, I mean, Hitchcock was a was a man that you felt absolutely had the movie in his head to to the letter, and once he kind of finished the pre production phase, the movie was already made for him. It was just a question of going out and shooting it. Uh, now that stands in stark contrast to someone like a Robert Altman, uh, who kind of you you could feel the journey of exploration of of, surpri- of surprising moments popping up actually while he was shooting the the movie kind of defining itself during the shoot. Uh, do you? Think yeah. The, well, that, uh, there would also be more messiness yeah. in Robert Altman. I'm not a great believer in ad libbing or that kind. Usually, it's very self-absorbed. It's very self-indulgent. It rings false. It's. It, but I think that they both reach their definition. I mean, their destination in different ways. But Hitchcock was not. I mean, he, it wasn't just. He didn't suddenly become a pure technician. He had to say, "Oh, that actor brought something to my film that I didn't expect. I'm going to change this shot or shoot it again." And this idea that he said actors are cattle, and he's repeated, he's uh, he's corrected that a thousand times. He said, "I I didn't say actors were cattle. I said they should be treated like cattle." And the difference was that he meant. They should be led, they should be guided, they should be shown the way, but they aren't they aren't bestial or they aren't they aren't just beasts of burden. Now he was a perfectionist. He also was a very very good businessman, marketer. And so he would bring the film on in under under budget instead of over budget. 
Peckinpah's film, every film went over budget. Many of Allman's films went over budget. Uh, Hitchcock made Psycho for $800,000. And he knew what he was doing, but it doesn't mean that that there's not some life in it. He did storyboard before shooting, but it meant it it, it didn't mean that the, the thing was completely done. Um it was it, it was alive like I think a personal relationship is alive. You know the other person, you know 80% of them or 90% of her or what whatever, but it doesn't mean that you know everything and that you will be surprised. Bruce Dern said in shooting Frenzy, you just have to, you'll ask for reshots, but you better just, you, you've got to be very careful and pick three that you're going to do, and he will allow you. And why would there be a reshot? Because the actor thought that he could do something different, or that Hitchcock would talk to somebody in another situation and say, why don't you do this a little more? And so it's not it's not dead and buried before it's made. Uh, there is so much, there is so much ignorance or so much jumping to conclusions that simply is, is not valid about someone like Hitchcock. It's easy to say, well, he thinks actors are cattle, and every film is made, and there's no life, so it's just like plumbing. That's that's not true. If you understand. If you understand art and the act of creativity, you know that he is not just going and making a stillborn film. Mm-hmm. The film has life. The film, there's something. If, if when you watch it, you watch those scenes between McCallan, the inspector, and Vivian Merchant, the uh, his wife, and they're wonderful. I mean, it, it, there's just a, and I'm sure some of them were redone because. Maybe a little iota, maybe a little nuance was added, or a little change, a little move the camera, a little tiny bit, or or had a different idea. He didn't go. He didn't go to the the set as a corpse. He went to the set as a creative individual that had certainly in visual in uh, visualized everything, envisioned everything, but was willing to allow it. To have some percolation, to 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 somehow simmer, and so uh, I think that is just an, an an easy reaction to say that uh, no, he just shot the film the way it was it was on his boards, and there's no creativity and blah blah blah. blah. <laughs> that's that's just nonsense. I agree again. with you, uh, and, but even in terms of his visual scheme, uh, I mean, there's such an alertness uh, there. I mean, the, 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 his movies are so vivid. So vibrant. well, that the alertness, the alertness, is what makes his film still vibrant today. Yeah, that it's a it's an alert. It's not a dated alertness. It's a it's an alertness and, and a vivacity that comes from human nature. From comes from our our human being, our human qualities. And so, when you say that alertness is a great word for that, because you can go and see any of, or most of his, maybe maybe not Topaz and a few others, but most of his films, and they don't, they they, they live, they they they're still alive, and you've seen something this time, or you're you're aware of something that you weren't aware of before, or you know, you suddenly realize that you found out that Hitchcock is very interested in making religious allegories. Mm. So when he has a character named Eve, that alerts you to something. And when the, the villain in that film is made, is named uh, Van Dam, and there's a snake, and there's a garden, um, it becomes a religious allegory on one level. It doesn't mean it is a religious film, but it is on one level. Uh, on another level, it's satire. It's satire of religions. It's satire of institutions. It's satire of the inability of the nuns and the, the priest to save 
the girl they can only run up to the dead body there's no there's nothing there or in family plot kicking over the gravestone and saying fake fake I mean, there's so much there's so much i think i think the fact that we are delayed on our recognition of what works in hitchcock just means that there's more to to plumb there's more to uh, fathom mm-hmm. uh, it's 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 it really is inexhaustible and yet the thing uh, w- the first question you 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 asked me the idea of suspense and thriller is something that made him marketable but then he could be and he could give nine out of ten people in the audience that and they'd be satisfied with that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but there was another tenth or another one in ten or one in twenty that went back and said oh my goodness look what the 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 eyes of the farmer in uh, um, the birds they're they've been plucked out just like the eyes of the mother in psycho oh the two poodles that hitchcock is coming out of the pet store there's a pair let me look for pairs this time. Oh my goodness, there are pairs galore, and they aren't mm. accidental. They aren't arbitrary. There's a there's a real intelligence at work, and maybe it's just because the audience does not expect it to be tel- intelligent. Maybe not even want intelligence, but it's there for you, Jamie, and I I know that you respond to it. I love that. I love that. I mean, I, I love the kind of the subversive details that <clears throat> reveal themselves to you the more you watch a film, like pe- peeling layers of an onion. I love, and that's the, one of the main things I love about Kubrick, too. And, and that's the very definition of a, a movie that lives, a movie that gives that to you. And you, be, you may be in two different moods or mm-hmm. two different ages, and you see vertigo as a young man and you see the romantic qualities of it but you see it older and you realize that life does have its um, traps and its its disasters and its unexpected horrors and 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 the film is different for you or maybe and I, I when you go to that film, Madeline, the name Madeline means the tower of strength. Well, they, she falls from the tower. The tower is the major or one of the major symbols in the film. If you've seen a Hitchcock film and you react to the hands, to the hands reaching out, to the hands trying to make contact, you see it in almost every one of his films. If you're if you're looking for it, if you're not looking for it, you don't see it. And one thing that, that Hitchcock does that I think the director of Arbitrage did, and other directors that have come down the path, is the manipulation of the audience. Mm-hmm. Hitchcock may have been the first, and he certainly is the best at getting us to empathize with the villain. I want to talk about performance in his films um, because to my knowledge, he only there was only one actor that he felt that he could not get anything out of, and that was Charles Lawton. I think they did the Jamaica Inn. Some, I think that was yeah. the name of the film. Uh, but other than that, I, I think largely a, a number of his actors... Responded. No, there have been, been... Roy Finnis was the villain... Uh, in family plot, and he was replaced by William Devane, uh, mm. and and it was a great replacement because Devane's voice is much more sonorous, and there, there's a, a mellifluous evil quality to mm. it. Many times, he also, like Kubrick, here's another thing that they have in common. He casts. Uh, a character, an actor, knowing that he's going to use that actor's emotions or lack of emotions, and that 
people work on the screen differently than they work in in person. There's a story that uh, after they shot uh, Vertigo with the exquisite just um, anybody that has a beating heart was infatuated with Kim Novak, Mm -hmm. but she wasn't a great actor. She was wooden. She was kind of uh, wooden or glass and but he he got out of her the image because of the lighting and the qualities. Well, Bernard Herrmann, who did the great, great soundtrack for Psycho in 1960, and guess guess what won the the sound award for the 1960? The Alamo. <laughs> Doesn't that say it all? I mean, that's oh, yeah. it all. We- we go back. I mean, and we talk. We talk about that movie all the time, The Alamo, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. and especially the sound, the 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 the, uh, the 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 Texans hooting at the attacking Mexicans. Oh, jeez. But yeah. uh, so well, he so so Bernard Herrmann, Bernard Herrmann wanted to date um, Kim Novak, and asked. Hitch to kind of set it up, or and he went out with Kim Novak and said it was the worst date maybe he had ever gone on because she had no personality. She had, or at least there was no there was no talk about electricity. There was no no nothing between the two of them. But Kim Novak on the screen was this intriguing and enhanced. Beauty, uh, just beyond um, mere mortality, um, and I think Hitch and Kubrick are very similar in their approach to actors. Now, obviously, Kubrick shoots many more takes of his actors, but they're, what emotion they bring to in their real life, but he he he, he budges them into something else. The fact that Kim Novak in some ways was boring and he was able, she was boring because the character of Judy was kind of boring. Hitchcock made Judy this boring Kim Novak into Madeline, this exquisite Kim Novak. And Kim Novak was the clay that Hitchcock was able to to shape. Um, and you look at like this frenzy that I talked about. One of the reasons it wasn't popular, even though it's, I think, one of his half better best films um, of his 53, so that that'd be uh, 26 and a half, um, is is John Finch play John Finch? Who's he? Because it was it was shot in England, and he just wasn't known. But he was ideal for the character because the character was human but negative human but but there was there was a lot of him that was uh flawed um and he was terrific in the part he was i'm not sure anybody could have been better but he wasn't a name star and so hitchcock often saw in the actor something that would really fit him his vision on the screen, and of course there are, are the endless blondes, the Kim Novak, yeah. uh, the uh, Marnie Nixon, uh, or uh, not Marnie Nixon, but Marnie, uh, all of the characters who are blonde, because there's something about the blonde that he feels in his films has a an elegance that a redhead does, just doesn't have. I'm not fighting. I'm not fighting this fight. This is Hitchcock's fight. <laughs> <laughs> he was very adept at seeing an actor's kind of hidden potential, and I, I'm thinking of uh, primarily Perkins <clears throat> in Psycho. I mean, we've lived with this movie for well over 50 years now. We've had various sequels, you know, and, and you know Norman Bates has become kind of an industry unto himself. But but take all that kind of crap away and and just see the performance for what it is in that first film that that is a beautifully nuanced 
performance, and it's actually and going on what you just said, I do find it one of his most kind of sexually perverse films. Well, I think there's I think there's uh, sexual perversity in most of them. I mean, there is there is um, sexuality is as dangerous and as corruptible as religion is, or as law enforcement is. That all of these human qualities and human institutions that come from the, the human qualities are. Uh, uh, Rift with uh, with corrupt and, and decadent decay and and abuse uh, and so it's it's hard for love to exist in the modern world or in the world of either Kubrick or or, Hack- or uh, Hitchcock. He he was renowned for working within. Primarily, I, I guess two genres: the the thriller and the kind of the the spy movie, the grand adventure spy film. Um, w- w- in terms of the the grand adventure, the North by Northwest, the the the, the notorious that kind of thing. W- w- where do you do you see his voice differing at all in those films from? His I films? really don't. I think they're better. They're they're his voice at its best. Um, I think both of those films are wonderful, um, mm-hmm. notorious. Sebastian loves uh, the Ingrid Bergman character even more than um, Devlin, the Cary, the Cary Grant character. So there's moral ambiguity. There's there's a, a sense of love that he sacrifices his life, the Claude Rains character, Sebastian, sacrifices his life so that she can escape. I think it's a really interesting portrait and, and, and study of love and duty. The other one, North by Northwest, it's got so much beyond, beneath the surface. But I see that this is this is an artist with the same vision, and you can pick out ten of the same themes, ten of the same instincts or ideas or qualities in all of his work, and it is in the, in both of those films as well. Well, at at, at the base, I mean, North by Northwest, <clears throat> it's kind of it's about a man wrongfully accused. Uh, it, 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 it's just done in the service of an adventure instead of a, a thriller. Yeah, it's a, yeah, and and it's it's also but he doesn't exist. The yeah. character d- that they're after doesn't exist. He's a concoction by the CIA. So we've got a ra- uh, we've got a reality and illusion or delusion, and all of the different qualities. And then at the end, when she. When he's reaching for her, and uh, also that the, 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 the Leonard is about to stamp on his uh, his foot and gets shot, that is pure Deus ex machina. There's no way that hands save in that film. What saves is fate. Mm. Nine out of ten times he would have stamped on her, on him, and it would have fallen to their deaths. It would it would have been. It would have been over, but fate, fate this time, comes in and spares them, and that goes all through Hitchcock's work. Hitchcock looked at religion as he looked at at sexuality from so many different perspectives, personal and imaginary, mm-hmm. and I think it, it, it it's another prime example of his artistry, of his ultimate extraordinary artistry. And the last question about Hitchcock, and and uh, because you you feature a great interview with him in your book, you had you. Cor- you had correspondence with him. Uh, tell me about that dynamic. I mean, what what did you kind of respond to the man 
in, in the man when you met him in person? What, what was that like? A guy who worked for Universal, who was one of the promotion promotion guys, uh, set the interview up, and he told me after the interview that Hitchcock had given the thousands of interviews, and he said he said a couple of things to you that I've never heard him say before. I, hmm. I really liked that. I, I mean, I was really rewarded by that. Yeah. What setting did you meet him in? His office? I met him. I met him on this. Uh, first of all, I saw a scene in in the family plot. A friend of mine who uh, interviewed him one time, another critic, said he he was going to a Hitchcock. Hitch was going to show him a freezer, and the guy was scared to walk into the freezer. <laughs> he thought <laughs> Hitchcock would shut the door. No, Hitchcock wouldn't shut the door. But but, but uh, so it was it was it was it was at the studio. It was a Universal Studio, and of course he had his own he had his own building there because he was yes, he was so yeah. bankable and he was so. Uh, it's funny. I was I was t- I, because he he would play these kind of devious games with reporters that would talk to him. And, and I, I talked to Stephen Rebello, who wrote the right. book on the making of Psycho. I mean, it's one of the great making of books ever. Right. And he said he uh, got Hitchcock to participate in an interview uh, for his college newspaper. He he was in college and he he managed to snag Hitchcock. Wow. And he said he went he went to his office. Who's he related to? <laughs> exactly. Who is he? He, he was he was in the waiting room of his office, and he peered through the door. The door was open just enough so that he could see Hitchcock sitting in his chair, getting a shave by a man with a straight razor. And just as the guy was approaching him with a straight razor, the door kind of closed. <laughs> a Hitchcockian beautiful. effect. 